So really quick recap, before we get started, the webinar is being recorded, but your microphones and cameras are both turned off. Secondly, keep an eye out for the follow-up email tomorrow, including both the recording of the webinar and a link to the follow-up survey. And lastly, please submit any and all questions, comments uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen instead of the chat box for us. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. This is Order of Operations for Warm Season Lawns. So the focus of this webinar is to truly expand uh, upon the instruction sheet that you receive with your first box at the beginning of the season, right? And so while this is a really good uh, general guide for over the course of the season, we want to expand upon this and note uh, when to complete some of the other or additional practices. So for example, in addition to controlling for weeds and treating pet spots, patching and seeding, fertilizing the lawn, and controlling pests, we want to start to transition to more of a cycle or a cyclical um, view, if you will. So the lawn is a dynamic system, right? And so at the start of the season, our focus is to truly consider what is occurring within the lawn. What are the key components of this area? So at the start of the year, before we get started, we want to consider, are there areas which have struggled in the past? If so, get ready. We're going to chat a lot about compacted so soil tonight. That's one of our favorite examples. Um, but for example, if an area is struggling, could it be compacted? Should we consider aerating or top dressing? Do we need to adjust our watering schedule, for example? So if we better understand the different areas throughout the lawn, essentially the uh, how this is really a living environment, essentially, will be better prepared for ch any changes which do appear over the course of the season and ensure we have the optimal path moving forward. Secondly, we'll consider controlling weeds tonight. Thirdly, repairing the lawn. Fourthly, fertilizing the lawn. And then lastly, maintaining. So this will be a, a slide where we'll chat a bit more about common changes or common um, concerns you may see over the course of the year and how best uh, to address them. I do wish to know, however, that keep in mind that with each of these components, the environment is crucial, right? So we need to consider uh, what is occurring. Is it a rainy day? If it is, we might need to adjust uh, when we're completing these actions. If it's too early in the season, we may want to hold off on completing some of these practices. So please feel free to uh, ask any questions which do arise. For example, um, if you haven't completed anything yet, is it too early? Should you complete it, et cetera? And we're always happy uh, to ensure that we have, again, the optimal path moving forward. And considering that, we'll uh, go over to Ivana and chat about lawn preparation. Yeah, so this is definitely, you know, the first step you want to take um, as your lawns are greening up. I know ours have, in the South have been green for a little bit now. Um, this is just things that you kind of want to make sure are completed or in the, in the works as, you know, your lawn starts to grow. So with that, you know, just kind of make sure um, temperatures are around 60 to 75 degrees for any of these practices. Um, and this is just looking at, you know, the health of your soil, kind of taking a comprehensive look at anything that needs to get done um, this season. So one thing you think about if you've got a Bermuda or a zoysia lawn, um, you may need to scalp it. And that would be the first mow of the season. That would be cutting it a little bit shorter um, just to remove any of the dead material um, from your dormant grass that happened over winter. So this is only for Bermuda, only for zoysia, those two grasses. Um, scalping is a great way to make your lawn look better and improve the health. Um, other grasses like St. Augustine are a little bit too thick to scalp. It'll damage the rhizomes or the stolons, rather, um, the ones above the soil. Bermuda and zoysia usually have rhizomes under the soil, so you're not going to be damaging anything, damaging anything by cutting them a little bit short. Um, Dethatching is something you may need to consider. Uh, it's kind of the buildup of any, you know, brown or dead material from the grass. Um, about an inch of, of thatch is okay. That's something that'll just protect your soil from environmental changes, you know, temperature changes, um, and it'll just protect the grass roots. But anything over that can hinder um, fertilizer take up or water take up. It'll kind of become a barrier instead of something helpful. So you may need to dethatch, but again, an inch is totally okay. Um, another thing to think about is aerating or top dressing. So, like we mentioned earlier, if you've got a compact soil, um, this can happen if you've got a heavy clay soil. This is something that'll just kind of happen with clay soils. Um, or if you've got a lawn with a lot of foot traffic, something um, where the kids, you know, play soccer a ton on your lawn or your dogs are very large and they run on your lawn constantly. Um, this will impede water and nutrient flow to your grass roots as well as oxygen flow, which is actually a very important thing for grass roots to, um, to use. So if you start noticing that maybe water is pooling on your lawn or it takes a lot longer 
you know, for anything to kind of move through the area. Um, a good thing to do would be take a screwdriver and push it into that soil. If you're met with a lot of resistance, it's probably time to aerate. Um, and using a core aerator is the best way to aerate. This will um, remove plugs of soil from the area. So a spike aerator will be something where you're pushing into the soil and that will create a compacted layer around the hole that it makes. But with a core aerator, you're removing pieces, meaning that you're not compacting anything around it, allowing for better oxygen flow and water flow. Um, core aerators most likely won't need to buy them. You can rent them at your local hardware store, but it is a good thing to do you know, if you've noticed any sort of compacting, compacting issues. Um, top dressing is another really helpful thing. I usually kind of pair them together. So after an aeration session, I like to go through and top dress. Um, top dressing with a top soil or compost is a great way to add organic matter to your lawn, which helps nu nutrient retention and water retention. Um, it also helps the microorganisms in your soil. It helps the earthworms, anything like that. Uh, just kind of helps you create a healthier, better soil um, that helps your grass hold on to the nutrients you give it better, helps it retain moisture more easily. Um, makes it to where it's not going to be as stressed if you had, you know, a newer soil. Um, along with top dressing, there's a different kind of top dress, which is kind of amending the pH of the soil. So if you've got a very acidic soil, um, this can happen if you've got, you know, a lot of, you know, pine trees or something like that. Uh, they drop a lot of leaves, making it acidic. Or if you've got a very alkaline soil, so in central Texas, we've got limestone bedrock, which just means it's going to be alkaline basically, no matter what, you're going to have to amend it. Um, for the most part, grass has you know, a really high grow range, anywhere from like a 4.5 to almost a nine is totally fine for grass to grow. If you notice that you're outside of that area or if you notice any sort of nutrient deficiency, even though you've recently fertilized, you may need to amend your soil with lime if it is too acidic. And you can get those lime pellets at a hardware store that'll bring up the pH of your soil. Or you can use something like a sulfur to lower the pH of your soil, making it more acidic. Um, again, not usually needed, but um, you will know if you need it, basically. Uh, it's something that it can be pretty, um, pretty harmful if it's a very high or low number. Um, another thing to do, and this can be related to top dressing as well, if you've got a really bumpy lawn. So, you know, over the winter, if your dogs were playing, making it really muddy, kind of creating little divots or piles of soil, now is a great time to start to level it. So along with the top dress, I kind of mix a little bit of sand in there if I need to level just to increase the drainage a little bit. And you'll want to use a builder sand. It's a sharper sand. It's not something that will aid in compaction. It's something that will help keep it very open, porous, and easy for water to flow. So, you know, just put that in the lower areas, break it over a little bit, make sure your lawn is even. Um, this is a great time to do it before, you know, your grass is really starting to get started. Yvonne, all, all really good points. And I am going to uh, jump, jump ahead a little bit for just a moment. So we did have a question come in uh, regarding the, the herbicide application. We'll touch more on essentially herbicide application and then also the repair process. But would you be able to expand upon top dressing here uh, just briefly, essentially why we do recommend top dressing yeah. when repairing and how that, that can help? Yeah, so top dressing, um, it, you know, it adds a good bit of organic matter. So this is something that's really important, especially for a new build. Um, if you're somewhere, you know, your housing development is only a few years old, I would say anything up to four is gonna be considered a new soil. Um, it's usually not gonna have enough organic matter. It's not gonna have a lot of nutrients in it. Top dressing is a great way to add those back in. Um, and then when repairing your, uh, your lawn, so, you know, if you went through this, winter, which was kind of mild, and then you got hit with that freeze like we did in Texas, um, there are probably going to be some areas of your grass that are a little bit thinner or not doing as well. Um, top dressing is a great way to encourage um, the grass to spread into those thinner areas. Um, and it's a great way to help seeds as they start to sprout because it helps retain a little bit more moisture. In Sergio, you can find top dressing at Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, it is basically any sort of topsoil or compost. So if you just look at, you know, if you go, you look at the bags there, um, you just want to see, you know, if it says topsoil or if it says compost. Um, that's a great question, Stephen. Uh, top dressing can be about, I like to say about a quarter inch um, because you don't want to smother your grass. You don't want to choke it out. You know, it's kind of the opposite of what we're trying to do. So quarter to half an inch, depending on how long you keep your grass. You know, if it's Bermuda, go lower because you keep your grass lower. If it's St. Augustine, you can get away with a little bit more because St. Augustine likes to be tall like me. Um, so yeah, top dressing, you really just need a thin layer, you know, go out there with a wheelbarrow, break it in just a little bit. Perfect. And the majority of these actions are going to be complete over a, a 
significant period of time, right? So for example, if we're looking at top dress, it's not necessarily a one-time application or right. a pH adjustment, right? Right. These are things you're going to have to do multiple times, especially if you're a new build, I would recommend top dressing twice a year, once in spring, once in fall. And that's another thing too. And again, with top dressing, my favorite subject, sorry guys. Um, you want to make sure that temperatures are mild because organic matter stays hot. That's how composting works. That's how, you know, microorganisms produce heat as they feed on, you know, decaying plant materials. So you want to make sure it's no hotter than I would say like a 77 to eight. I would even say it's probably too hot. So 75 to 77 in the hottest part of the day, just so you're not burning your lawn with what's supposed to be good for it. Okay. I think I've exhausted the top dressing now. Move on to weeds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next up after lawn preparation, you're gonna wanna take stock of your weeds. So as this relates to your plan, you know the lawn preparation is something that you're gonna do before starting your plan with Sunday, but weeds are kind of the next step after your soil test. Um, so you're kind of want to take stock of what's there, um, you know, kind of consider if it's something that can be left there if temperatures aren't right to repair your lawn. So if it's still a little bit cold to seed, Bermuda likes to be seeded at 80, 85. So, you know, it might be too cold for to seed Bermuda right now if you've got a Bermuda lawn. Um, think about, is it something that can wait? Um, if you're just mowing, um, like we say here, uh, mow and bag your clippings, remove those seed heads, but maybe just leave the plant there until you can, um, you know, treat it and then seed right after. because Treating it's great until you've got a bare spot and then another weed takes its place and it could be a worse weed or a better weed, but you won't know until, you know, it's there. So as far as, you know, weeding, uh, the first thing I would do is just maintain first, just mow, bag your clippings. Um, I would mow pretty often since they can produce extra seed heads. So, you know, mowing once a week and bagging will get those seed heads away. And speaking of top dressing, throw those in your compost pile. You can use that to top dress next year once it's ready. Um, some weeds, you know, our hand pulling is a great option, but some weeds aren't good to hand pull. Something like a nut sedge, for example, you don't want to hand pull that because it's got these little bulbs under the soil that can um, reproduce. So once you pull it, it'll grow more. Um, for more information on specific weeds um, or specific ways to treat specific weeds, we do have a weeds webinar. There is one recorded on YouTube, but we will have one again in the future. Um, just take a look at our calendar when, when it's updated. Um, so I'm not going to get too in the weeds there. Uh, but yeah, so other weeds that you have, dandelion doom is great for broadleaf things, uh, clover, um, it treats moss, dandelions, um, broadleaf plantain, a lot of you are probably seeing a lot of henbit, those little guys that are with the purple flowers, um, all of these are covered under dandelion doom. Um, for things that are grassy, so if you've got a lot of crabgrass or um, I'm blanking on a lot of grassy weeds, poa annua, so annual bluegrass, things like that. Um, you can use Weed Warrior. Uh, you just want to be careful with Weed Warrior because it is a non-selective herbicide, meaning that it doesn't care who it hits, it's gonna do damage no matter what. So if you're planning to use Weed Warrior, I would recommend doing it right before you are seeding or repairing or when your grass is dormant. So one of those two extremes, um, really early in the season when the grass is still dormant or later in the season when it's time to repair and you can kind of um, you know, afford to damage a few grass blades and then prepare it after. Um, but you know, if it's something that you're really having a hard time with the like crabgrass, you can use weed warrior. You just want to make sure to be able to treat your lawn well after. And just to expand upon all this, right? So if we're looking at a significant weed issue at the beginning of the season or if we're at a point where it's okay, what do I do now? Right. I treat for the weeds and I'm not really sure how best to proceed. Bono, what would your recommendation be? Because there's a point where it's essentially want to prioritize the good grass grow, right? And we don't want to be here until uh, all the way through the summer treating for weeds, right? Right, yeah. So I would just get to a good place. So, you know, take stock of your weeds as your grass is graining up. Notice the ones that are really aggressive. Try to remove those first. Um, but if you've got something that's just kind of hanging around, you can kind of afford to leave it be. Um, it's not spreading a lot because you're mowing it and you're bagging those clippings. You know, you can go ahead and fertilize. You may see some more growth with those, but it'll be a good time after to, you know, remove them as you go on. And you'll get weeds over the course of the season, you know, you're gonna, you know, fertilize your lawn. And then a few weeks later, you're gonna start to see some other weeds pop up from the seed bank in the soil. And that's, you know, just making sure even though you've controlled your weeds first, you're still gonna get some over the course of the season. So you can still make sure to remove those as time goes on. Um, and you, all you need to do is wait 24 hours between dandelion doom and your fertilizer applications. So it can be done over the course of the season. Um, yeah. Yes, Stephen, um, that's a great question. Um, we will get 
do into that more, but um, short answer for now, yes. And I think we're actually moving on to that um, after weeds. So if no one has any questions about weeds, we can go straight into your questions, Stephen. All right, repair section. So this will be after, you know, you've taken stock of your soil, you've looked at what weeds you have and how you're treating them, and now you're gonna get into repairing your lawn. So you wanna make sure temperatures are right. That's gonna be kind of the biggest factor for overseeding. Um, so overseeding a Bermuda, you wanna make sure it's at least, you know, 80, 85, just to make sure that seed germinates. Uh, things like a zoysia or centipede can be a little bit lower in temperature, but you do wanna make sure it's consistently warm. Um, that's kind of the thing with, you know, the south, everything's okay with more heat. You wanna make sure you give it what it needs. Um, so as far as your question, you know, dethatching, top dressing, controlling weeds, and then overseeding. That would be the last step in all of the things that you mentioned there. Um, so once you get into, you know, making sure your temperatures are right, you're ready to seed, you're ready to sod or plug, um, now would be also a great time to take stock of, if you have pets, if there's any pet spots in their lawn. Um, if there are, um, you can use our pet patch right here. Uh, this has a surfactant. This will pull the pet waste deeper into the soil and kind of dilute it. Um, that way you don't have such a concentration of the pet waste there. So use it as a spot treatment um, on the areas that you feel are very severe, um, or if it's something that you deal with consistently, uh, you can just use it um, as kind of a blanket application multiple times in the season if needed. Um, and with that, you just wanna wait 24 hours between doing anything else. So, you know, wait a day, and then you can continue on with feeding, sodding, anything like that. Um, after you've, you know, use the pet patch if needed, you go down to kind of looking at what your grass needs, where are the weak areas, um, not just the bare spots. Um, yeah, Sergio, you can use the pet patch as you see fit. So, you know, if it's something where your pet pees in a certain area and it's something that, you know, you're really struggling with, only use in that area. Or if it's something that you know your pet goes everywhere in your lawn and you can't pick out the specific spots, but you know it's harming it, use it as a blanket control. Um, either way, it's a great thing to use to pull out those contaminants. And again, just wait 24 hours between that and any of the other applications. Um, so yeah. And Yvonne, real quick, we'll chat more about this too uh, when it comes to fertilizing, but really good point to bring up also that pet patch doesn't contain any nitrogen, right? So right. we don't have to be right. as concerned um, from no fertilization perspective as well. Right, yeah, there's no there's no fertilizer in pet patch. It's, or there's no nitrogen fertilizer in pet patch. It's just there to kind of help it recover. It's not something that's gonna try to make it grow. Um, all right, so grass. Uh, seeding is a great option for some grasses. Sodding is a great option for other. Bermuda does well from seed. Um, St. Augustine doesn't have viable seed. And even if you would get it to grow, it wouldn't grow true. There's a lot of good cultivars out there. Natural St. Augustine is not gonna be as nice. I promise you that. So making sure you know what kind of, your, what kind of grass you have is an extremely important step. Um, if you have any questions about that, reach out to us at webinars at Get Sunday. Send us a picture. You can even text us um, just to make sure you know what kind of grass you have. Um, and to make sure it's a great fit for your lawn. You know, if you have a new build and the builder put Bermuda down, but you also installed some beautiful oak trees that are going to get to 25 feet, you know, maybe it's trying to start transitioning from a Bermuda to something that's going to tolerate a little bit more shade. Um, so as you're looking to seed or sod, go ahead and remove any dead material or leaves, any debris um, covering the soil. And then you're going to want to rough it up just a little bit. Um, and then, of course, my favorite thing, add a little bit of topsoil there. It's going to help no matter what. Uh, it'll help the seeds, it'll help the solder plugs either way. Um, and if you're noticing some smaller bare spots and you've got a grass like St. Augustine or zoysia, something like that, that you don't necessarily feel like seeding, uh, if you've just topped just that area and move some of those long viney bits, those stolons into that area, um, they will grow in and they will repair themselves. Now, St. Augustine is starting to explode. So now is a great time to start top dressing small areas of your lawn and letting it kind of fill in before looking at trying to add anything to it. Wonderful. All right. So transitioning to fertilizing, the bread and butter is Sunday, right? <laughs> this is what you signed up for. And so the key points to keep in mind, again, we want to consider the environmental conditions. And so what we mean by this is, you do see as the third bullet point, we recommend only applying the pouches when the temp range is between roughly 50 degrees to 85 degrees or so. So in the summertime, if you're in Texas, for example, and it's much warmer than that during the day, then we can certainly look to work around that by applying the pouch in the morning, for example, when it's a bit cooler. I wouldn't rely upon this as the, the sole factor to consider, though, when looking to apply a nutrient pouch, right? And so the reason I say this is there are two other 
um, conditions I would consider. And the first is, is the grass currently stressed? So if the grass is currently stressed, we don't want to encourage new growth essentially by applying the fertilizer, right? We wanna make sure that the grass is healthy and before applying a pouch. So if the grass is stressed, let's hold off on that nutrient pouch application. Additionally, if the grass is currently not growing, whether it's due to being in a um, summer dormancy, for example, due to excessive heat, or if it just hasn't quite greened up and is actively growing yet, we can hold on to that nutrient pouch application as well. So these are the two key conditions that I consider before applying a pouch. And then if uh, they are both satisfied, then I would move to, okay, well, looking at today's weather, I'm going to apply the pouch at you know, 10 or 11 a.m., for example, uh, just to make sure I'm in that, that uh, recommended application 10th window. So keeping this in mind, you do have access to your My Plan page, right, which is a great resource. You can see um, I, on the side here, I actually did complete all of my pouches in, in this uh, situation. We'll see in a couple of other webinars, I actually missed out on an application, but great checklist to have. Um, but these application dates are flexible, right? They're a great starting point and they're a good recommendation, but if we need to adjust them, we certainly can do so. Just keep that in mind. For example, if you have uh, rain for a significant period of time, we want to hold on to the application as well, just to make sure it, the pouch isn't diluted essentially after applying it. So um, just some of the factors to keep in mind, key takeaway, always feel free to follow up if you have any questions about shifting an application date, and we can certainly do so. When it comes to mowing, uh, the bigger the biggest focus here is that we do recommend mowing before an application. So essentially there isn't a delay. We can open up that grass canopy and make sure that the pouch is best absorbed and help stain uh, that grass, for example, if there is a bit of iron. Um, but after an application, we wanna make sure that we do wait a couple of days before mowing, just to make sure we don't just cut off that new growth, right? From a watering perspective, again, we just touched on this briefly, before an application, we do recommend lightly watering the lawn if the grass is uh, due for a watering. Again, I wouldn't apply if the grass is heat stress or showing signs of drought stress, but if you're, uh, you can certainly just go ahead, lightly water the area just to increase the absorption of the pouch essentially. After an application, however, it's also imperative to consider that we want to make sure there isn't rain in the forecast for at least 24 hours or so. Um, so same thing for your watering schedule. Try to hold off on watering for at least 24 hours just to make sure we aren't just washing that pouch away. Um, of course, you never know what the weather is going to be like. So if there are light showers shortly after applying a pouch, we may be fine. But if it's, there's a heavy downpour, then I'd be a bit, bit more concerned. So always feel free to reach out if you have any questions. If you uh, if it rains immediately after an application, or if you just want to make sure that the pouch wasn't wasted, essentially. And we did have a question. Um, Jean over here. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, has a very young uh, Bermuda lawn. She wants to know if there's a guide she can get online to use in North Carolina weather for her Sunday plan and overseeding. Um, she plans to start this week. Um, what's a great way for her to to kind of get that information? Yeah, really good. Really good question. We're happy. We can send a follow-up email um, as well once we get out of the, the webinar here. But your local cooperative extension is mostly likely a great resource as well. They typically have some great uh, resources just to be able to provide a little bit more of a guide. But um, we're also happy to essentially create a little bit more of an updated uh, schedule for you as well, just to be able to include some of the key uh, factors to keep in mind when it comes to seating and timing there. So keep an eye out for that. <laughs> And we do have temperatures listed, you know, for all of our seed and stuff like that. Um, but again, we'll reach out to you after this webinar. I'll, I'll send you an email kind of going over your schedule. But for the most part, it's not going to be, you know, set in stone. It's always going to be variable based on temperature. So it's a little hard to, to keep track of, but we'll make sure to, to show you that. And I do see we're coming up on time here in just a few moments. So... Uh, like we said, feel free if you do have uh, have to leave, please feel free to do so. We'll still send out the recording, but do you have a couple of good notes coming up? So don't want to rush through these. Um, so I did want to include just a couple of pouches you may see. So Pet Patch is a pouch we could have included here as well. Uh, but Lawn Aid is a summer uh, heat stress or summer stress preventative treatment. So essentially a pouch that we would look to put down uh, before heading into the extreme summer heat doesn't contain nitrogen. So again, we don't have to be as concerned from a fertilization perspective or essentially adjusting our application schedule. Um, but same thought process of just making sure that uh, we don't apply it before a rainstorm, for example, does apply. 
And green out is an additional pouch you may or may not receive. This pouch tends to be sent out if you have fertilizer blackout dates in your region, um, just to be able to apply a pouch. Does not violate the blackout uh, restrictions though, so it doesn't contain any nitrogen, phosphorus, but uh, is essentially best able to help improve the soil, if you will. So again, you'll be receiving the best pouches for your region. So if you do live in, area, in an area with blackout dates and you don't receive green out, this doesn't mean that uh, you didn't receive the correct pouch. Just taking a look at the total nitrogen load over the course of the year, making sure we essentially reach that desired load. We may, or may have a bit more flexibility or might be able to adjust your plan slightly. All right, and lastly, coming to maintain. So looking um, over the course of the season, right? So if you did prep the lawn at the beginning of the year, you've uh, gone through, you've controlled the weeds, you've prepared any of the areas, you've been fertilizing, everything looks great, but you start to notice some changes in the lawn, right? And so this is where I would always ask, what has been, in a, what has been occurring from an environmental perspective, right? And this is why it's so crucial uh, to consider this. So for example, if you start to notice lawn start to brown, have you noticed that the temps have uh, been, been extreme for the past few weeks, right? Have you gone from 70 degree weather up to 90 degree uh, weather? Um, has there been a change in the amount of precipitation? Have you gone from receiving it uh, very little rain up to a significant amount? Have you audited your sprinkler system recently? If not, then could one area might not be uh, could one area not be receiving quite as much water as the rest of the lawn? Secondly, keep track of these changes, right? This is always great information to be able to reference, uh, especially chatting with our yard advisors, be able to say, you know what? I noticed the lawn start to change in this area at this specific time, um, and then it seemed to expand from there. Or, you know, it seemed like it impacted the entire lawn starting on this date. This is all great information. And from there, we'll be able to develop a plan. So taking a look at this image here, there are a number of factors which could be at play, but assuming Let's just say this is an early spring um, image that you see in the lawn, some bare patches. This could be due to compacted soil, for example. So it could be that the area is not draining quite as well in some of these spots, and we could be running into a bit of a, um, a fungal concern, for example, where there's too much moisture. Uh, we could be looking at cold damage, depending on the grass type and the area we're located at. Um, we could be looking at potentially mowing at a little bit lower of a height or essentially an uneven lawn in this spot. So the key focus here would not be, would be that it isn't necessarily a fertilizer solution, right? We might be looking to essentially, if it's more of a fungal concern, minimizing the amount of excess moisture in the area, and that should improve uh, the area. If it's more of a um, cold damage issue, then we'd be looking to essentially add a bit of topsoil or potentially uh, look to um, install plugs or seed, depending on the grass type to repair the area, but it wouldn't necessarily be a, a fertilizer solution in some situations, such as a certain uh, fungal issues that can actually exacerbate the issue. Looking at this image here from Michigan State, uh, slightly different region, but still useful information. So if you start to notice patches develop at the lawn, uh, especially with St. Augustine, for example, it could be chinch bugs, um, grubs are popular, sod webworms, um, but uh, patches like this, where there doesn't really seem to be any correlation between the area and uh, the damage, right? So for example, it doesn't seem to be an area that uh, receives more sun or more shade uh, than other areas. Uh, there could be some correlation, but it, it, where it almost has a bit of a compounding effect, right? Where pest pressure can almost exacerbate other uh, stressors, but pests tend to be in, in abnormal areas. Then this may be a location where essentially we could chat uh, looking for the pests within the soil, we could chat about a soapy water flush test um, and essentially look to either apply a product to remove the pest or look uh, to repair the area to minimize further damage and prevent them in the future. Again, the focus here is if the grass is stressed due to a turf grass pest, we don't want to default to applying fertilizer because that will most likely exacerbate uh, or worsen the conditions. And lastly, just a gold lawn, right? So this may be a situation or a photo that you'll see uh, later this year, right? If it's summertime and you're noticing extreme heat, you're having a very difficult time uh, promoting a, a deep and infrequent watering schedule. It just seems like no matter what you do, you cannot keep the lawn green, right? Or if you have watering restrictions, it may be beneficial to consider, is it just heat stress? 
right? And so almost this golden look, it's not necessarily a bad uh, sign if the grass starts to go gold, right? We actually do recommend allowing uh, the grass to go gold or essentially enter a summer dormancy, depending on the region, uh, and picking back up with the fertilizer applications or, allow, or uh, encouraging new growth later in the season when the temps drop. In a situation like this, we wouldn't necessarily encourage to bring the grass out of the, the summer dormancy, right? Dormancy is more protection uh, mechanism, right? So if we're unable to maintain that green grass, it may be beneficial to allow it to enter that dormancy for a few weeks. Again, we would not want to default to a fertilizer application in this case and encourage the grass to exit this dormancy. So the reason that we wanted to touch on this, we could spend an entire webinar most likely on each uh, of these factors, but I want to make sure that one of the most common questions we receive is, well, my lawn is starting to yellow, should I apply fertilizer, right? And while that can help in some situations, in most situations that can actually exacerbate the issue, right? And if we actually understand what is occurring within the area or have a better understanding because we prepped uh, the area at the beginning of the year, we'll be best able to identify a solution and make sure we minimize the amount of time looking to determine what's occurring in, in the area and determine a solution. So as a brief recap, as a potentially a bit of a simplified <laughs> explanation, if the grass seems to have weak roots, so for example, if you lift on the grass and it doesn't seem to be well-rooted, it could be a turf grass pest. Uh, if the grass almost is spongy or discolored, it could be a, a fungus. And if it has almost a dry or blue-gray hue, then it could be heat or drought stress, right? Essentially signs that the grass needs to be watered. So please feel free, if you do notice uh, any changes over the course of the year, always feel free to reach out to our team at webinars at getsunday.com, um, send in pictures, and we can chat about, about the change. But key takeaway, don't default to uh, fertilizers being the, the end-all be-all, right, or the only solution to make your grass green again. And with that, I realize we are way over. <laughs> so I truly appreciate uh, you all being here uh, tonight. Are there any other questions before we uh, get to the final slide. Wonderful. Well, we truly appreciate you all being here tonight. Great participation. It was great to be able, uh, great questions and be able to interact with you all. Um, if any questions do pop up, feel free to email us at webinars at getsunday.com. Keep in mind that our blog, The Shed, is a great resource providing um, how to articles such as how to test for compaction, how to audit your sprinkler system. It's a great resource. Our YouTube channel is an additional resource uh, providing product overviews, uh, instructional videos, chats with our very own Dr. Frank Rossi from my alma mater, uh, chatting about common lawn questions. Um, and keep an eye out for future webinars as well. We'll be continuing this into over the next couple of months and we'd be thrilled uh, to chat with you again. So. Keep an eye out for the follow-up survey dealing with weeds, warm season lawn. Ivana, anything I missed? <laughs> Only thing I want to point out is I know a few people had some weed questions. Um, I'm kind of blanking on when our next weeds webinar is, but we do have the previous recordings on that calendar. So, you know, anytime you look at the webinar calendar, if there's something that's happened previously, if you click on that one, it will direct you to the YouTube link of that previous webinar. So, you know, watch those. If you have any questions about them, you know, feel free to email us at webinars at Get Sunday. It's most likely going to be the people that are hosting that webinar, so we'll be able to know exactly what you're what you're referencing. So, you know, keep in mind we're here as a resource. We're here to help. Which want you to have a better lawn. And that's it. Take care, y'all. Have a great day. Have a good night. Take care, everyone. Oh, night. Yeah. <laughs>